Dear friends and colleagues, uh, and a warm welcome to this 77th Radboud uh, Grand Round. My name is Jan Smit, I'm the uh, Interim Dean, and uh, it's a very special occasion uh, tonight. Uh, and this is beca because we have a very special keynote speaker, Samuel Shem. A very warm welcome to Samuel, it's great to have you here. You're here on the occasion of the uh, Fourth World Society of Emergency Surgery Congress, which is also taking place this week at the Radboud UMC compound. Samuel Shem, a very famous name, at least for people from my age category, because we all know Samuel from his book, The House of God, and this book at least helped me to, to survive the traumatic episode of medical education, but I can understand that some people decided to quit medicine after reading this book because of the cynical uh, content. And probably also uh, some uh, participants here decided to change medicine and to uh, fight for a better system than what was described uh, in this uh, book. Samuel Shem is a uh, graduate from uh, Harvard uh, Medical School and um, an Oxford and Rhodes Scholar. And he were, was on the faculty for 35 uh, years. Uh, so he has a lot of practical experience and we are very eager to hear his uh, personal growth, the story of his life, starting with this book and working towards this second book, which will be published, I think, in November of this year, Man's Fourth Best Hospital. So, Samuel, the floor is yours and we are uh, delighted to have you here. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. Uh, I want to thank, uh, first of all, Richard Tenbrook and the amazing Marjolyn Klump Cool. I'm not sure if that's pronounced right, but you do, uh, for helping me to get here so, uh, so easily and happily. And I'm looking forward to the surgical conference, too. Uh, you know, there's this old joke, uh, a surgeon is a Jewish doctor who can't or a psychiatrist is a Jewish doctor who can't stand the sight of blood. Um, uh, I'm delighted to be speaking in Holland again, uh, the first country that actually took up the house of God in a big way, the first foreign country, was Holland. And uh, one day a guy pedaled from uh, uh, the airport in New York through Harlem all the way up to our house in Boston and started, he said he wanted to organize a Shem tour. And so he I, I wound up touring almost all of the medical schools in, uh, and even uh, twice to some of them. Uh, Groningen, of all places, twice. <laughs> One of the things that uh, I realized in my age is that our uh, lives, all of us here today, are uh, determined really by a flicker of a butterfly's wing going one way or the other, right? If it happened to go the other way, none of us would be here, right? You each have your ind individual stories. And that's a story with me. I was very, very lucky to uh, the things that happened to me to lead to the house of God and uh, to the other novels I've, I've written and plays. And uh, the new one, which is called Man's Fourth Best Hospital, which I find, I'll tell you that story of how the butterfly's wing flickered just right, so all of a sudden I could do that, which comes out in November. Um, I, um, I'll tell you one story about the House of God to start. Uh, when it came out in 1978 in America, uh, it, I w it was really a split in the reaction the older generation of doctors, and I was at Harvard Medical School as a teacher in those days, that generation of doctors hated it and hated me and did some really nasty stuff to me about it. But the people my age in that group uh, just absolutely went for it. You couldn't, it just flew out of the stores. There was no publicity, there were no reviews, there was no nothing. Word of mouth went, you know, the only thing that really sells a book is someone says to you, you gotta read this book. 
And that's what happened with the house of God. So I feel very lucky. And after all these years, I get to feel pretty confident that I'm not hated anymore, you know, three million copies along. But I found out fairly recently it's not quite that easy. Uh, when our daughter, uh, several years ago, was in, uh, in uh, elementary school, they, uh, the, the parents had a potluck supper where people you know, bring stuff and you all get in, not with the kids, but just the, stu the parents were there. So I was wandering around with my plate of food. I'm a little bit uh, bashful, actually, and I didn't know who to talk to. And I heard these two women talking. And I said, ah, this, is, uh, this, this may be promising. And they listened. They're, they're doctors. And I said, great, I'm a doctor, I'll go up. And then they, I heard, they're doctors from the Beth Israel Hospital, the house of God, right? So I sort of wait for my time, and I, I kind of uh, pull a chair up, and I wait for a break in the conversation. And I said, you know, I may not be the most favorite doctor at the Beth Israel Hospital. And one of them looked at me, and she said, well, you can't be as bad as that guy that wrote that book. <laughs> And there was this delicious silence, you know? And I said, well, I am the guy that wrote that book, you know? And she blushed beet red. And that was the last play date our daughter ever had with her daughter. But now it's, now it's easy, you know? All of a sudden, people basically like me and the book. Um, what I, you never know why you start doing something. I mean, I, I never wanted to write a novel. And uh, I just, uh, I started to write The House of God as a kind of a catharsis from what then was the worst year of my life. And, you know, we, we got, uh, you know, our guys who are still in the area, the interns, Roy and Eat My Dust Daddy and all the rest of them, uh, we got together, we got drunk, we smoked cigarettes, cigars, everything. And uh, I just started writing as a catharsis. And uh, I never really thought of getting it published. And I went on with, I was in my psychiatric residency at McLean Hospital, a big psychiatric hospital at the time. And I, uh, I was looking for a play agent. In, and so somebody gave me the name of a play agent in New York. And I wrote to her and I said, blah, blah, blah. And I said, PS, I have part of a doctor novel. And she, novel. And she wrote back and she said, I don't do uh, plays, but I do fiction. Why don't you send me what you got? What I got was, uh, you know, beer stained, cigarette butts, tobacco. It was just this mess, single spaced. I mean, I didn't even know you're supposed to double space things. I had 50 pages. I threw it in the mail. And I forgot about it. I got myself a play agent. About two weeks later, I'm in this uh, standing in the secretary's group in the hospital, and then I get a call, and the secretary says, oh, it's Miss, it's so-and-so, and I didn't even remember her name, you know? So I get on the phone, and this is the first feedback from the world of this book 40 years ago. And uh, she says, well, I don't know if you're a madman or a genius, but I really love this book. And I said, I had the presence of mind, I said, well, I can't really help you there, but you, you should know I'm speaking to you from within a large mental institution at this time. <laughs> so then it started. Then it started. And over the years, uh, I've realized why I write. I mean, I never thought of it before. But somehow or other, I, I, it got clear. And uh, it's very simple. I write for two reasons. One is to bring attention to injustice. I was a 60s person, you know. We, when I, I was in college, not me, but we got together, took action, and we had two great accomplishments. This is in the late 60s. We helped put the civil rights laws on the books uh, in the United States, and we ended the Vietnam War. So when we, us, our, the, the people from Harvard Med and others, went into our internship, we came with very high ideals, very humanistic ideals. We, we, we wanted to really help people. And it, we, we came into contact with this hierarchical, unjust system that basically did all the things that were abusive that were in the book. And so um, 
we naturally reacted. You can read the House of God, if you want, as a kind of a book of resistance to an unjust system. I won't say how, but you can, you can look back. It's a resistance novel like so many others. Not, not that many others, but, but a lot of others in the, in the world literature. So the first thing I write it for is to bring attention to injustice. The second thing I write for is to show the danger of isolation and the hearing power of connection. The danger of isolation and the healing power of connection. A good connection. What's a good connection? A good connection is mutual. If it ain't mutual, it ain't good. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what I mean by that later. Uh, So the, the other thing I would, I would say about the publication of the House of Books, really, I, I was very idealistic in those times. I was a purist. And it came out in 1978, and I said, I'm not gonna, I don't want to publicize this book. I took a pen name. I went on with my life. And I thought, it is, real writers don't go out and support their book. That's what I thought. And I got tons of invitations through my publisher to do things, commencement speeches. I said no to all of them for two years. And that, then, at that time, uh, a letter came to me through my, uh, you know what a letter is? Any of you know what a letter is? It's this thing that comes in a piece of paper, it has a stamp, you know, you're, it's very nice, wasn't it? I'm looking at the older ones, wasn't, weren't letters nice? You know, if you wrote a love letter and you wanted the love letter to, to be known as a love letter, I don't know if it was through here, you put the stamp upside down. Um, so I got a letter from my publisher, and uh, uh, it said, I'm a doctor in, and I'm on call all night in a veterans hospital in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and if it weren't for your book, I'd kill myself. So I had an epiphany. I said, well, oops. Well, if they, if they want to if they wanna hear, maybe I've got something to say. I never thought I had something to say, but maybe I've got something to say. And uh, I started accepting invitations. And what I talked about is what I always said, the danger of isolation and the healing power of good connection. The thing that gets me going to start a book and I've written others as well with this, is this sense of what I call, hey, wait a second, moments. And a hey, wait a second moment, certainly if, we were, if I were talking in New York, you'd have had these moments maybe already today, not in Holland, though. A hey, wait a second moment is like when you're walking along the street and a guy down in his luck or a woman asks you, hey, you got a dollar, and you walk past. And then a little while later, you say, hey, wait a second. He didn't look so bad. You know, why did I just do that? You know, and then you reconsider. In the house of God, there were so many, hey, wait a second moments that I felt that somebody had to write about this. And it obviously was me, right? And I was lucky in another way, because for whatever reason in my upbringing, which was rather difficult, let's say, I, lear I, don't, I don't run on fear, which is has its pros and cons. I don't run on fear, but I run on guilt. Right? So I do something, and then I really suffer. And that's, so I didn't mind all the criticism. I didn't mind all of that. And if you know you're telling the truth in a novel, uh, that will keep you going all the way. It doesn't matter what people say. I know what I did. And luckily, as I'll talk about it, I have the same feeling right now with Man's Fourth Best Hospital. So uh, let me read you. A single, just, just one thing from the house of God. What I realized also when I went to read it, when I went to write it, was um, that it was so bad that I, it, it, it had to ride on humor if anybody was going to read it, right? You just, they, they would just say, oh, you know. And as we had relied on humor to get through it, it's written very close to the bone. A lot of the stuff is really very much like what we did and were. Um, and so this is the kind of humor I use that's, that stands out, I think. Um, this is the runt. Uh, 
at the beginning of the year, uh, he came to lunch. The runt put a pillar on his hamburger and munched it down. I asked what it was. Vati Valium, vitamin V. Uh, does the Valium help? He said, uh, it makes me feel kind of sleepy, but I feel pretty unflappable. I'm writing orders for it for all my patients. What, you're putting all of them on Valium too? Why not, he said, they're all very nervous having me as their doctor. <laughs> After the others had left, the run said he had a confession to make. It's about my third admission last night. In the middle of all this trouble with the yellow man, this guy comes into emergency and I, I couldn't handle it. I offered him $5 if he'd go home. <laughs> he looked at it and left. He took it and left. Okay. Um, and of course, not all of the house of God is, is, well, certainly not all of it is funny, and not all of it is cynical, even though it was called that. It was true, but people took that uh, as being cynical. And in fact, when I went back, I found out that there was something that was a kernel of what I was to realize later in my life. And it came from the fat man, mostly. The fat man says in the house of God toward the end, um, about patients, I make them feel that they're still part of life, part of some grand nutty scheme instead of alone with their diseases. With me, they still feel part of the human race. And if you go back over the book, he uses that phrase a number of times, with me, to be with the patient, which is one way of saying to be empathic with the patient, to make a good connection with the patient. And I, I, have, I put into Roy's mouth what he says, what these patients wanted was what anyone wanted, the hand in their hand, the, the sense that their doctor could care. Right? So I was sort of moving in the right direction, and I, I, have, to, uh, I have to say it's, it's uh, because of the, mostly because of whatever I've learned about relationship, about good relationship, well, if men are honest, they would say whatever they've learned about good relationship, they've learned with a woman. Of course, a lot of men aren't that honest, right? And everything I've learned is from Janet Surrey, who was the Barry in the book, who is, is still, is now my wife and uh, mother of our, of our child. And she's, a, she's been a clinical psych psychologist for a long time, but now actually she's a kind of very, very uh, wide-ranging uh, Buddhist teacher. Uh, when people ask me if I'm Jewish, I say, uh, you know, I'm only Jewish on my parents' side. Uh, okay, let's look at, and, and just one word about it being a resistance novel. In the words of Chuck at the end, when, when everybody's sort of, you know, trying to deal with what's happened to them in the meeting with uh, the, uh, the chief, uh, he says it all, boil, it all boils down to one thing. How can we care for patients if nobody cares for us? How can we care for patients if nobody cares for us? And so after all this time, I mean, I really understand much better why it was abusive, OK? In big hierarchical systems, the pressure comes down and the lowest down get, get isolated. What happens in the, in the uh, house of God is that the interns got isolated. One way they got isolated was from each other, right? You notice the friendships deteriorate. One, one kills himself, one goes crazy. Isolation. The second way that we got isolated, isola isolated was each of us got isolated from our authentic experience of the system itself, right? So what we got to think, what, you know, we're crazy for thinking this is crazy. And that's a very bad place to be, and you each have had a little hit of that, of course. And then the final thing, which has gotten a lot better in Amer American medicine now, is each of us, because of the on-call schedule, which was miserable, each of us got isolated from our loved ones and family. So we were alone. We were alone three different ways. And, uh, that's really what did it. Nobody, in the words of the fat man, was with us. Nobody was with us in that abusive 
was an abusive system. Now there's a very, I don't know, is the term burnout, physician burnout come here yet? It's not really burnout, it's abuse. Burnout sounds like we can't take it. Abuse means somebody's taking us beyond our, our extremes. It's a moral difficulty we're put in, where what we think is right to do with patients, the administration thinks, and insurance companies think is right. Now, in terms of resistance, let me just finish that piece now. Um, the only uh, power of the subordinate group, whether it's being subordinate by race, religion, sexuality, uh, skin color, uh, uh, opportunities, or economy, the only threat to a dominant group is the quality of the connection of the subordinate group. That's the way things get done. The quality of, of uh, connection in the subordinate group. That's how you change an abusive system. And so the, what I, the, the, old, the, the next la law, as I would sort of suggest, um, is I, what I tell medical students and interns and residents, and even doctors now, the main thing is to stick together no matter what. Stick together no matter what. Isolation is deadly, connection heals. Um, and connection is an interesting thing to talk about. You know, the other, another law is connection comes first. If you're seeing a new patient, and all the clinicians know this, if you're seeing a new patient, if you connect, You'll hear the story, right? You'll hear everything, hear everything. If you don't connect, you won't hear anything. Connection comes first. The second thing about connection, and uh, the second thing about connection, is that, uh, listen, think about your own relationships for a while, for a minute, uh, that nobody gets it right all the time. It's not just what you say or do, it's what you say or do next. And it's true with patients, too. If you have a screw-up in the interview, then you make it, you know, you'd... even saying we're in a disconnect is a connecting statement, right, when you're stuck, right? So it's not just what you, what you say or do now. It's what you do next after you make the mistake. And, you know, that has a lot of implications in your life, et cetera. Once again, the, the answer is to stick together, to be with other people of the same mind, et cetera. Um, now, let me give you a little lesson in the other big thing that happened in my life. Um, and this is with Janet, who, when, who joined a women's group called the Stone Center Psychological Group at Wellesley College, which radically addressed uh, the way women's uh, understanding of psychological health and growth was not this in line with what the, man, the male self model was. The usual Western model of psychology in the, in, in the West is that, uh, that psychological health and growth resolves in, this, re, 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 resolves in the self. It's a self-centered theory. What the women did, and it didn't speak to women. Women are the carriers of compassion, caring, uh, taking care of other people, et cetera, empathy. Um, what, what, so what the women suggested, with a lot of scientific data that's come out more recently back then, uh, is that the uh, health, the psychological health and growth of a person is in the quality of their relationships, is in the quality of their connections. And if you have a good relationship, that, in, that helps both people in their psychological gro uh, growth and health, health. We did a whole bunch of uh, gender dialogues all over the world to kind of look at this. Um, and uh, so connection comes first. Now, what that means practically in your practice uh, and in your life, this is all practice plus life, is that it's very helpful to learn a, a shift to the we, a shift to the we, uh, meaning that um, even when you, I'll give you an example from surgery. So the old time surgeons in, 
in America, certainly, the patriarchal surgeons would say, I've done all the tests, I'm going to operate on you. Right? That's an IU. Um, the surgeons nowadays say, say, often say, I did all the tests, um, you can go get a second opinion. That's the I and U as well. What if the, so, and the I of U is, is, the, is the province of, uh, of lawyers. That's not us. We didn't want to be lawyers, so we're doctors, right? It, they're, they're in adversarial relationship all day long. And they think when they shut off the light to go home, they can leave it, leave it, leave it in the office. It doesn't matter. It can't, you can't leave your work in, the, in what we do in the office very easily. So, um, so what if a surgeon said to uh, a patient, uh, we've done the test. Let's talk about what we're going to do. We've done the test. What, let's talk about what we're going to do. Three we's in there. We've done the test. Let us talk about wh what we're going to do. What's the patient going to say back? What's the, first, what's the first sentence the patient will have? The patient will say, well, let's do this, or I think we should try. If you put the we out there between you and the patient, almost guaranteed it's going to come out as we back. It concretizes the sense that there's a relationship here in this room, right? What's the single most, uh, what's the, sing what's the most uh, prevalent reason why surgeons get sued? Do you know that study? A good study on this. The patient says, I didn't have a relationship with him or her, right? So try it. Slip, slip a we into something with the patient. See what happens. Do your own little study. I want to give uh, one other example of what I'm talking about, about making connections. Think of a good lunch you had, say, with somebody. Maybe you haven't seen this friend for a long time. You have a lunch, but you're a doctor. You have some kind of crap to do afterwards that's really hard, that you don't want to do. You feel down. You feel, not, how am I going to do this? You, know, you go to the lunch. And if it's a successful connection, five good things will happen. These are the five good things. Think about it. Number one, you will leave, you will both leave the lunch with an increased sense of energy or zest, right? Two, you will leave, both of you leave the lunch with a better knowledge of the other person and knowledge of yourself. Three, each person values the other person and values him or herself. Number four is power, which is really important. Power. In the connecting, each, it, 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 each of you leaves with an increased power to take action. Right? And then finally, it's, hey, let's do this again. You want to see the person again, right, for, to keep, keep it going. The power thing is really very interesting, because usually the model is, oh, Henry Kissinger is a powerful man, or whatever, whoever it is at the time, that you didn't feel powerful when you came to lunch. You thought you couldn't do what you are going to have to do. But in the connecting, power arises. Your energy gets more, right? Good connection means being a good doctor. It makes it easier to be a good doctor. So, the, from the I to the we. OK. Um, let me move on to where I am now more uh, with Mansworth Best Hospital. And, um, you know, once again, I've just been so lucky. Uh, I was. I had left psychiatry quite, quite uh, you know, after about 20 years as a therapist. I specialized in addictions after a while, mostly, uh, alcohol and, uh, and drug abuse. And actually, my wife and I wrote a play called Bill W. and Dr. Bob, which is about the relationship between the two men that founded Alcoholics Anonymous in 1935 in Akron, Ohio. And um, uh, it was, it, I don't know if you know about AA much. But you know, it played for a year off Broadway, and it it it, it it's a perfect example of a mutual of a good mutual connection. Because when these two guys met, Bill was a drunk stockbroker about to die, and Bob was a doctor, Doctor Bob Smith. He was a surgeon who was a drunk and about to die, and they 
happened to, be, to come together in Akron in 1935. Neither one of them wanted to talk to the other. But Bill said to Bob at that point, he said, well, you know, I had a doctor in New York who said maybe alcoholism is a disease. And, and then Bob, being a doctor, he perks up. And he says, a disease? With what? Signs, symptoms, a course, and a progression? And, and, implying what? A treatment? So he said, let's find the treatment for this. It's amazing. Put it, he put it into the medical way. And, um, and so that's, that's what they did. Now, the essence of AA is what Bill said, which is that um, the only thing that can help a drunk is telling his story to another drunk, right? Finding that mutuality, right? Um, and also, this is another amazing thing, their work uh, was said that to treat an alcoholic, uh, you had to attack it on physical, psychological, and spiritual realms, right? And that's the birth of the holistic movement in America in 1935. We've sort of come to realize that at this point. So, um, and you, of course, are going to, no matter what kind of doctor you are, you got to deal with alcoholism. and. Uh, um, and AA is, uh, is a, is a tremendous, and other 12-step uh, programs. They're really active in Holland, aren't they? AA, AA and NA and all that. Yes, no, not so much, no. okay. Um, okay, so there, I, so there I was, I was, uh, I was just being a doctor. I mean, I had sort of quit being a doctor with a psychiatrist. And uh, one day out of the blue, Phone call came. Hi, I'm the dean of uh, New York University Medical School. Uh, I, I want to offer you, a, I, wa I want to know if you want to be a professor of medicine in medis medical humanities. I said, what? <laughs> you know, well, I, don't, I didn't understand. I didn't know. And I said, well, what do you want me to do? And uh, he said, well, we want you to teach. So me, I said, well, wh what do you want me to teach? He said, dummy, we want you to teach the house of God. <laughs> Harvard hated me. NYU loved me. <laughs> what was I going to do? They paid well, too. So I commute from Boston. And, and what it is, it's a beautiful humanities program for uh, whoever wants to go, med mostly med students. And I do six uh, one and a half hour um, programs uh, going through the book. Uh, with the students. And you know something with all this stuff about computer screens and all of that? I mean, for an hour and a half, there are no screens in there, and you can hear a pin drop because the, the sense, the feelings of the house of God are just as resonant now. It's very, very gratifying uh, to me. So why did this sort of, why was this a flicker of, a, of this wing? Well, I'd been out of medicine for like 20 years. I wouldn't go in on rounds. I wouldn't have them patients. I was a writer. And so I went down to NYU. I spent a lot of time on the train between Boston and NYU. And um, I was kind of amazed when I got into that system because, you know, I, I, I did things like I, I, went, I stayed overnight in the emergency room at Bellevue. Bellevue Hospital is a public hospital that uh, has 900 patients, poor people. And they, if they show up, they get in. If they show up, they get in, which is unbelievable in America right now. Uh, so I stayed there. I saw this. And I saw one little thing got me, you know. I was in the middle of the 3 AM in the Bellevue emergency room, which you don't want to you don't, you don't spend much time there. And the guy who's emptying the trash isn't surly. He isn't resentful of having a job emptying trash at night at Bellevue Hospital. He's talking with the hospital, with the nurses and the, and the doctors and stuff. He's, he's kind of happy. And I, as I went around, I noticed most of the people in this system, as opposed to the Harvard system, were, were kind of happy. Why? I found out. The top three people the dean, CEO, businessman, clinical man, the top three people of this 47,000 person uh, organization are all refugees from the house of God. 
they, one was in my internship group. They, were, they had been abused in the Harvard system, and now they were not going to abuse others, right? They broke the cycle of abuse. And people, it has a, it has a notion of spirit, you know, that, that we, and, and of, and of um, helping people, you know. Um, and so I've been happy as a clam there. Now, happy's one thing. Uh, getting hit by that wing was another. I went on wards, first time in years. And I saw these incredible things that medicine does. I'm sure it does it here, too, that medicine can do. I mean, my brother has multiple myeloma. That was a death sentence, right? When I, was in, I had patients like that when I was an intern, gone in six months. He's alive. He's pretty well. You know, from blood diseases that we now can treat, you know, with immunological therapy that's on the horizon, it's really promising, to, you know, inserting a valve through a vein or putting on a, you know, you know, faces, hands, everything being replaced. It's astonishing, absolutely astonishing. But, and this is the good news for Shem, the but, I also saw, well, as the narrator of, of Man's Fourth Hospital says, looking back from Costa Rica now on the year, in the House of God, you may remember, he's looking back uh, from France with Barry, Recounting the year, does that ring true? The first, me, the, the first uh, sentence in the house of God is, except for her sunglasses, Barry is naked. Anybody remember that? This one is, except for her eyes, Barry is fully clothed. Um, and so anyway, I started to, what I saw that was not right, as the, na the narrator says, he says, looking back, I am called to, to write about this period of time when medicine could go either one way or the other, either toward more humane medicine or to, to money and screens. And then he says, which is money and money. Because what we all know, and it's much worse in the United States, I know, what we all know, those machines, those computers, are, have been uh, designed for one main thing, billing, billing, right? Not for patient care, billing. The patients are run through it in order to, you know, and I'll talk a little bit about that. So that's what, that's what got me going. I said, hey, hey, wait a second. And well, let me tell you, doctors are going crazy with this in the United States now. Two doctors a day, a day commit suicide, um, you know, depression, alcoholism, et cetera, people are retiring early to, because they have to use these machines. They spend two hours in the machine with every one hour with the patient. The, the uh, interns at NYU Medical School, like all interns in medicine, in medicine this is, spend, uh, guess, what, guess what percent of their shift time on call, what's the minimum percent they spend in front of computer screens? Anybody want to guess? Minimum percent, the quiz. You don't get a present, but it's still a uh, What's the minimum percent that uh, they spend in front of their screens on shift? 40. How many? 40%. 40%. Anybody else? 80. 80? 80. 80. You win the prize. No prize, but 80%. How'd you know 80? Yeah, yeah. So anyway, it's two hours for everyone with patients. So it's so I said, hey, wait a second, somebody's got to write about this. <laughs> Moi. And I started about three years ago. And even at my great age, um, I think it can stand with the house of God. I really do. I mean, in the advanced reviews, you can go to. Uh, it's not on the slide. You can go to mansfourthbesthospital.com, and it, it's up and running, and it's, uh, it's going to be out in November. Um, you can pre-order and all that stuff. Um, it, uh, I mean, I was very, very lucky that I had time to do this and just did. The, the issue in America is, is, is different from it is here uh, in terms of the money. I had the experience at one of the talks I gave, I forget where exactly, uh, a medical school, and 
I had heard that a representative from United Health was coming to the school to spend the weekend with the, with the uh, general manager of the hospital, Men Medical School, uh, to see if they could uh, buy it or invest in it or invest in it. And I saw the doctor the next day, and uh, the, head of, the head of the place, and I said, how'd it go? And he said, he left after an hour, went back to the United States. I said, why'd he leave? He said, we can't make any money here. You know, the reason that it works, the only two industrial countries, I think, that have national health care systems that work are Holland and Switzerland. Why? Because it's heavily regulated. It's not worth these greedy insurance people's money. You know? And what I say, actually, uh, in the novel, I'll read a little bit from it now, um, is that has anybody ever heard when you're in a theater and somebody falls down, the cry go out, is there an insurance executive in the house? <laughs> no, we do the work, you know. Anyway, you're much better off here. You're much, much, you have no idea what this, you have no idea what's going on unless you've been sick in America recently. Let me just, okay, so what is this about? Let me tell you. Um, there's a hospital that's an, that is the, that this takes place in in the book. It's the same old cast, Roy, Barry, Eat My Dust, Eddie, Hyper Hooper, Chuck, and the Runt, uh, and some others, and some new people. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, there's this hospital that was the big WASP hospital. You know what WASP is? White Ankle of Saxon Protestant, a rival to the House of God, which was Jewish, you know. Um, I'm gonna get killed for this book. Uh, but there's this WASP hospital, there's a, a, new, a, a thing called U.S. News and World Report, right, that, that, that rates hospitals. They don't know what they're doing, they're doing it for money. But anyway, it's very serious in America. So U.S. News and World Reports in the book has man's, what used to be man's best hospital, now has gone all the way down to fourth best. And this WASP board of very tight Episcopalians, you know, they, it said that some of them began to feel sad. And one of them felt something he'd never felt before, depressed. Right. So what are they going to do? Anyway, long story short, the fat man has gotten rich and famous. First, not so much in the battle run, run of the stars in Hollywood, which is where we last saw him, but he's drifted into Silica Silicon Valley and he started a company to find the molecular, find and treat the molecular uh, basis of forgetting. So he's got tons of money and he's very famous. He's famous because of the book. Luckily, I can mention the House of God in this book because this is Roy talking about how he got his first book published, you know. So Roy is a narrator again. And so he's rich and famous, and by certain means, man's fourth best hospital uh, went, sought him out, because they needed more m money and fame, and they said, we'll give you a job, do whatever you want here, we just want you here. And what he wants to do is set up a public clinic, leaning up against this big 40-story you know, hospital, and his goal, and round up the, the people, and his, he says full autonomy, his goal is to put the human back into medicine. Put the human back into medicine. He's gonna show how to do it with his old team and a lot of new team. Now, he gets to parody of women in this book. You know, they, finally it's the same number of men and women, which I think is kind of neat. So that's what he does, and Roy uh, joins in. So, okay. You have medical, computer medical records, right? They're probably not like this. This is pretty true. Oh, it's just like the house of God. It's pretty true, you know, it's, it's real, it's true. That's what will get me in trouble. Um, okay, and the, and the electronic record, do you, do you have Epic here? Yes. Oh. <laughs> How many people love Epic? One. You love Epic. Well, in your position, okay. <laughs> um, uh, the, the, I won't go on. If you mention the word Epic, people hit the ceiling. 
in, because it's wholly a billing machine, wholly, almost wholly a billing machine. Anyway, uh, but that's not the, that's not the, uh, do you know, <laughs> if you're in a Harvard hospital, certainly the, the Brigham, I know, Peter Van Brigham, which has Epic, which lost $2 billion on the first try to get it going or something, uh, if you, you, are, you have to sign a, a uh, it's like a prenuptial, if you're, that you will legally, that you will not disparage uh, Epic publicly or in writing. It's a gag order. It's true, it's a gag order, you know. Okay, the, but the, the, um, the electronic record in man's fourth best hospital is called HEAL, H-E-A-L. We doctors had an orientation to heal, a four hour long video and workshop with a rosy cheeked and smiling clean young guy dressed casual t named Bob. Bob's first step was to pass out a single sheet of actual paper for our signatures and then he has him sign a gag order as I said. Um, then he says, folks, Bob said, clicking on the first slide which printed out exactly his words, we are at war against the health insurance industries. As he went, it turned out that this war, like all wars, was about money. On our side of the screen, we are fighting for the highest payment for our work. On their side of the screen, the insurance side, they are fighting for the lowest payment of our work. And how did we fight this war? By gaming heal codes of each disease diagnosis and treatment to max out money. In principle, we could max out cash by clicking on little boxes in two ways. The first was qualitative, clicking on the worst disease diagnosis, most severe form, requiring the most treatment. Second was quantitative, also clicking on as many different worst and severe disease diagnoses, requiring the most elaborate treatment for as long as possible. Right? So there's war across the screen. This is all true. Health insurance on the Army the army on the other side of the screen tried to minimize our maximums of money. Bad news, said Bob, and they have lawyers trained to catch us in an illegal, like lying which we do not do. The good news we have, this is true in one of the hospitals, the good news we have 334 people in the billing building. The billables, that's what they call themselves, the billables also the name of their a cappella song group. Um, let's see. Um, in real time, the billables track your choices to max out money. We have man's best lawyers to fight heels lawyers. Um, and that's true. They really watch the doctors on their screens from admission to discharge. Um, let's see. Okay. We nicknamed our elite billing enforcer team coders for cash. They work out of a war room at an undisclosed location. We're watching each of you for your choice of click codes from admission to discharge. Fiscally doing procedures on patients makes the most money. Surgical procedures make the most, most money. Medical care makes the least. He paused then said fiercely, except for the diagnosis of sepsis, severe. <laughs> right. After you click sepsis, the pop-ups ask mild, medium, or hot, severe like at a Thai restaurant. But sepsis is by definition life-threatening blood infection, always severe, monetized compared to mild or medium. Severe is a cash cow that wins hands down. We will dog you till the sun goes down. If you click sepsis, you always click severe. V code for cash. But then why, I ask, do you have boxes for mild and medium at all? Camouflage, he said. <laughs> For this fatal disease, we have to choose Hippocratically, but to click severe. He went on, I turned out, and caught his summary. It'll, and this is true, what I'm about to read. It all boils down to earwax. Okay? You know what earwax is, right? Mm -hmm. Earwax is an untapped, untapped cool, Bob said. pool, Bob said. Rampant in our senior citizens, a cause of deafness. How many of you routine, routinely earwax your patients? We took this as rhetorical and did not reply. 
The money in earwax flows by clicking this diagnosis in almost all patients and removing as much volume as you can. Bob then showed on the big screen a doctor at healing. You have to choose between two codes for earwax removal. 40773 is just for taking a syringe and washing it out, reimbursed at $77. Uh, or 40774 using the metal scooper thingy to remove it, 18250. The difference, 105 some dollars. And doing both, 35990. More than the sum of the parts. Multiply per person per year, millions. Guess which procedure for full extraction and max liquidity is preferable? Both. Do the right thing. The right thing for all of us of the Fat Man Clinic, that's what he calls it, the Fat Man Clinic, or the Future of Medicine Clinic, FMC. Uh, all of us of Fat Man Clinic was to walk out. I was with Chuck and Naidu, who's a new doctor, woman doctor, walking down the hallway. So Chuck, I said, what'd you think of that? Man, it all went in one ear and out the other. Heal is hell, said Naidu, who was expert in computers. The only good thing about Heal is that Epic is worse. Epic is best known. <laughs> Epic is best known for being the worst. How's it the worst, I asked. Oh, it's the most inhumane, of epic proportions, thus its name. Let me get this straight, I said. For money, we have to lie? Yes, said Naidu. One day, a few months ago, soon after I joined an ongoing group pediatric practice in the suburbs, I was told I was always required to click yes on the box for cardiac exam normal, even when I knew that it was irrelevant to that particular child and I had not done one. The only purpose of that click was to gain a few more dollars. I could not go along with that and had to leave. We doctors do not lie. No fooling, said Chuck, or else it's so long Hippocratic oath, okay? So you get the... You get the idea. And let me just, I just want to read one more thing, and then we can open it up for questions. Shortly we'll open it up for questions. Um, this is what the visit to the doctor is in America. I don't know if it's like that here. It seems like epic reverberated in this room. Right? Yeah. Um, OK, this is what I see. As, the dister, as, as your visit to your doctor. It's quite true. Your visit to your doctor has become satire. You walk in, lucky if you get eye contact, and sit across the desk. Your doctor is trapped, hunched behind a computer screen, back or, at best, cold, shory, cold shoulder to you. The doctor asks a question, you answer, the keyboard goes click, click, to click, faster and faster. On and on it goes, and you find yourself in the patient's quandary. Do I keep talking or wait for a break in the action? Usually the next question, is he or she still listening or not? The new definition of, quote, a good doctor, one who can contort his or her body to touch type while still making eye contact. As you keep waiting, two questions may enter your mind. What is he or she doing? What you don't know is that your doctor is sitting there in front of that screen seething because he or she is forced to sit in front of a screen seething instead of what he wants to do to talk and listen and be your doctor, a digital doctor. He spends 50% of every workday at least six hours in front of that screen. Family doctors spend an additional three hours at night at home during pajama time filling up the residue of the screens. Why is he doing this, or she? You might think he's doing this because it will be better for your health care. It will not. It might well be worse. Worse for your care, and for sure, worse for the care of your doctor. It's only better for the money that for the health and care industry. This, the machine you see is not designed for care, but for billing, to make as much money as possible. We doctors are caught in this mess, not treating the patient, treating the screen for money. And it's not that your doctor wants to turn his back on you. It's the health care industry that has turned its back on both you and your doctor. 
So let me end this journey and then have, have some questions. Um, I think what, the, if I were to sum up sort of what I've learned in these years, I'll be 75 and very soon, uh, Hiroshima Day, um, is that I would almost try to reframe in a larger sense what we do with our patients and what we, we do with each other. And that's about suffering. You know, we don't usually ask about what's your suffering or how, you know, how this all goes. You can try that word. It's a different word than what we usually use. And the reason for that is what I've learned <clears throat> is that everybody suffers, right? There are little sufferings. There are big sufferings. But everybody suffers. All of us in this room suffer, have suffered. No people have suffered. The issue isn't the suffering. The issue is how you walk through it. If, like the male model suggests often, uh, if you try to walk through suffering alone, you are going to, and not, you know, ask for help, talk to people. If you walk through su your suffering alone, you're going to suffer more, and you're going to, you're going to, uh, you're going to cause there to be more, you're going to spread more suffering around. The one thing you don't want to do in life is spread more suffering around. If, on the other hand, you walk through suffering with others, with caring others, and guess what? That's us. We are there at the worst suffering that human beings have in their lives. Birth, death, everything in the there. So that's our job. We are supposed to know how to help at that point. And luckily, it's at that point when suffering is opened up that we can help, right? That's our job. So if we walk through our suffering and the suffering of others with other people, we will not spread more suffering around. And we might even suffer less. And we'll come out of it with more of the five things, est, you know, zest, connection, uh, knowledge, power, and maybe even uh, some, some uh, spiritual strength. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sam, for this impressive uh, talk and uh, sharing your personal experiences. I'm sure there is much uh, uh, material for debate or questions. And who wants to start a debate? Probably I can start myself. Uh, so so uh, taking into account the 40 years between the House of Gods and your second book, it doesn't seem there is much hope that the system can be changed. We, we, we have some, some acts of resistance. We, we need connection to, to, to survive and, and to beat the suffering. And, and we still have our ideals. But is there really some hope that you could give us that we can change the system? Yeah, well, we're talking about the American system. The, the Dutch system is much better, okay. right, uh, from everything I've heard. You have no idea how it's bad it is in the States unless you've been talking to doctors and patients. I mean, I just, you're right. I, because I'm a doctor, you know, know a lot of people. I hear one harrowing uh, bad story about a doctor interaction uh, over and over. My wife and I just had one with somebody, you know. Uh, I, I need to get into it. But um, yeah. So Holland is better, and it's better because you have a national health care system. So I know it's private. I mean, it's sort of a private, well-regulated system, and it so works. We shouldn't travel too much to America to, to learn a lot of your health care system. Well, yes and no. Yes, not to learn about insurance payments of health care, but about, you know, it's a terrific scientific community and clinical community. And believe me, all of us are not Trumpites, OK? <laughs> Uh, it's the worst thing that's happened in my lifetime to the country. And I, I've seen a lot of bad things in the country. It's the worst, absolutely worst. But out of that suffering may come change. You know? OK, let me say, in the, in the book, I had such fun with this book. You know? I just finished it. I still have a couple of things to do. But um, in the book, in the middle of this you know, fat man's clinic, 
He says, I'm going to give you a lecture. And it's the middle of January. It's cold. Nobody wants a lecture. So, and he, even though he's a, he's a real technocrat, he does chalk and blackboard. Remember that? Anybody remember what that was like? Yeah. So he writes down the lecture he's going to give. Quote, the six rackets of American health care. You know racket, what a racket is? Six rackets of American health care, colon, follow the money. And then the, the next part is resistance to it, how to change things. And, and he doesn't do it in that lecture, but at the end, he does. I wouldn't, it wouldn't be fair for me to put up. And it took me probably a month to understand the six rackets, how, to, how all of them are intertwined. You wouldn't believe Fox TV, you know, hedge funders. Do you know that hedge funds are buying, are buying up dermatology practices? They are. If they, if they go bust, they win. If they lose, they win. If, if they, you know, it's crazy. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I, I, I talk a lot in the book about, about what to do about it. Because what, the essence is what I've already said. It's what I already said. The only thing that works is to get people together. Uh, I think I mentioned, go to, there's a little, no, all right. Go to the website, you'll, you'll see it. Is, is, the, the quality of the, of, the, of the subordinate group, right? And in America now, doctors are, are, you know, subordinate, very clearly subordinate. The business people are running almost everything. Um, what's going to happen, I think, I'm very optimistic, within five years, America will have some kind of national health care system. It's inevitable, partly because of the, do, the almost majority of women in the House Certainly, that's the hugest thing that's ever happened in my lifetime in the, in the, in, and maybe taking over the Senate. But in five years, there'll be some kind of national system, maybe Medicare for all. And you know, there will be a parallel system of for-profit insurance. What's, what they don't talk about is I have Medicare, okay? But everybody who can afford $100 a month can get an a Medicare supplemental system, which, you know, Sort of the doctors happy they pay a lot more, and I never see a bill. I never once see a bill. Okay, the issue is at that time when the Congress is going to try to get passed some kind of Medicare for all, whatever. The biggest argument that doctors say about that because they're all for it, they just don't. They say we we can't live on hospitals and doctors cannot live on Medicare Medicare payments are too low. They really are quite low. Hospitals can't survive on them. They get private insurance payments. But that's the point, that when it comes around to discussing a national system, there has to, the only way it happens, who is being hurt by, by this, uh, this for-profit? Doctors, nurses, other health professionals, patients. We, you know, it costs $10,000 per patient in America per year, you know. The highest, it's the highest pay anywhere, and we're like 39th in healthcare behind, below Togo or something, you know? <laughs> Seriously, it's, it's ridiculous, because there's a 35% uh, uh, administrative cost, okay? But anyway, hospitals, doctors, patients, and other healthcare, and pa the patient doctors who, uh, they get together, but the doctors get together and say, okay, you want to do this, Medicare for all, or whatever it is? We ain't doing it unless we, ain't doing it unless we get paid comparable to what we get now. And I ha you know, there are ways to try to start to do that. In America, doctors never have gotten together. They're individualists. They have never gotten together. Nurses have gotten a union a very powerful union in the United States, when they threatened to go out on strike, just threaten the nurses' union, they almost never have to go on strike. The Peter Ben Brigham, the hospital in Boston, was, they, they, they declared a strike at there. It went to the last day, and then the hospital gave them all that they wanted. And then in the paper, the Boston paper, like three days later, headline, Peter Ben Brigham spent $24 million getting ready for the strike. Doctors have to unionize. Okay, they so, have to. so we get a second lecture. Yeah, sorry, you hit, it's hard, yeah, stick together. Is there any question left? Otherwise, yes. So uh, you say that your book is about uh, 
about how bad it is in the United States, then will the rule still be relevant for us, us the, the Dutch, the our populace? This book will be uh, will not be relevant. It will be essential. <laughs> <laughs> this book tells you everything you need to know. No, I say that not 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 in jest, because it ranges from the politics, because that's what they're in. That's what they're doing all day. The screens. I have to write about that. Money and screens. It's about the politics, but it goes further, as I have in this talk with what I've understood about not only what is a good connection, but how you get to a good connection. And one of the ways that that's, you know, it's, I'm not didactic in the book. It's funny. It's, you know, all that stuff. But Barry is brought in by the fat man because the fat man doesn't feel like he really gets this empathy stuff, right? And that's what Barry knows. About. So Barry is brought in about two thirds of the way through the book. I've spoiled it for you, but she's brought in to be one of the team. So you will hear, for instance, some of that stuff in more detail about how to stay human, how to stay human in a clinic. Yeah. OK, we have one final question. Jeroen. Thank you so much for this uh, lecture. And I really enjoyed your book when it came out. And um, I was a surgical resident a few years later, and I recognized so much of your situations. And uh, we were as bad as the residents in your book uh, talking about patients, but it kept us alive and uh, what you said, you have to stick together. And if you stick together, you could survive, your patients could be, could be better. But in your next book, it looks like it's much more pessimistic because you cannot stick together. You, you cannot stick together against Epic. You cannot stick together against Heal. Uh, is it really this pessimistic? Do you see an optimistic future for healthcare or are we all doomed? Um, you know what? I didn't quite understand all that. Well, it was about the pessimism in your second book. I think you answered this partly already by announcing that the American health system will change and that there will be a national yeah. health system. But probably, um, so it was, I think, about the tone of your second book, which was considered it's rather not, pessimistic. It's not the second, it's my eighth. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> my, my sequel, yeah. Uh, I just talked about it, so maybe. So I graduated like uh, five or six years ago, and I started working on the internal medicine ward in a small hospital here nearby in Ada, uh, 300 people hospital. And when I started there, we started out with these patient folders. I can imagine you all know them. You had to write your uh, like in pen uh, what happened to the patient each day and what was the history and whatever. So at night. Uh, when you were on call and you had to find out something about a patient, what happened earlier that day, it was always a nightmare because you couldn't e either couldn't read or find the uh, folder or whatever. So from there, I really got the need for an electronic system. So A, you could read what your uh, colleague had, uh, had made out of that patient uh, the day before, and B, you wouldn't have to look for the folders. But what you describe now is more like uh, instead of a, a, you know, a logical uh, system to find your data that you need to make your decisions on, it's more a billing system or uh, whatever. So where do you see the transition from uh, like a, a, a sane way to store your data and uh, do better care to this billing system yeah. that haunts us all uh, and yeah. drives us mad? Yeah, that's a very good question. Is that an EPIC system that came in? Uh, it was a self-developed system, so the hospital closed down for two days when they uh, introduced it. So it wasn't an EPIC? It was self-developed. Self oh, okay. No, um, that's a great question. I am not against technology. NYU actually does have EPIC, but the dean and all the rest of them worked for years, a couple of years, to make it do what it wanted to do. So it's much better. Um, but there's one big difference in this country and America, basically, in, in that regard. It's very simple. And the, well, I have to say, let me just elaborate a bit. Um, I gave a talk to medical students at uh, Boston University Medical School last year. And um, 
<laughs> and they were... This is epic probably. Epic. <laughs> what does this mean? It's a national alert. A national alert. The Dutch telephone network. There's right. no Dutch telephone network. Okay. It's just technology, so please continue. Okay. Yeah, I want to. I want to answer. I want to answer that question. So, I was speaking to some BU students, really good students, and they were talking about how. Uh, how because of Epic, they, everybody was running, the, the rounds were nothing because the, the interns and residents would run to the screens and start typing. There was, there was almost no more teaching left at the bedside, okay? Which is typical now. Um, so I asked them, uh, have you ever found, and you know, these are, these are computer literate kids. They're, you know, two, a, a generation behind me, at least, or two. They know computers. They said, yeah, it's a terrible system. I said, do you know a better system? And they said, well, yeah, actually, there is a better system. They all agreed. And I said, what's that? They said, the Veterans Administration system, i.e., the government system, right? It's sort of clunky, but it has, you know, you, you just you can type notes on it. It goes, it's interoperable to all over the country, if not the world, including the Indian Health Service. It's simple to use. It was really good, you know. And um, I said, well, why, why do you think that was so good? What, what's, what's at the bottom of this? You know what they said? There's no money being going through it. There's no money going through that machine. They're, they don't pay anything. The government pays it. I mean, they have to write down you know, notes and what. So I'll, I'll spoil the book for you a little bit. Because what you know, I said that the fat man talks at the end about what to do about this. Well, this isn't all you do. But one of the things you do, he said, squeeze the money out of the machines. <laughs> And all of a sudden, you have health care. So you. I think this is some great final remark <laughs> and a conclusion of, of, of your lecture. I would like to thank you all. Just a small announcement. This Thursday, the 27th, there will be a demonstration with a trauma helicopter and all kinds of equipment, fire department, trucks, police vehicles, ambulances between 4 and 6 PM, and this is part of the World Congress of Emergency Service. <laughs> so you're all invited, you as well, Sam. And uh, the next grand round will be on Monday, August 19, with as a guest Ingrid van der Geest about innovative orthopedic surgery on the MITEC Operation Theater. So thank you all. And, uh,